Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You need me, just give me a second. You know, income. Yeah, I need to. My name is like Tom Fox. F O X. Not two X's, one X. <laughs> and I'm very pleased to be your master of ceremonies here tonight. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you out here in this lovely scene from up here. And I'd like to welcome you on behalf of all of us up here to the first salute dinner for the Tuskegee Airmen here, the first Detroit dinner, but certainly the first international dinner. Salute. I don't know how it uh, looks to you out there, and especially as we have come in from all the inclement weather that we've had here in the last few days here in our city of Detroit, but believe me, from up here, looking out there, and I'm sure my head table guest will agree with me, you are a beautiful sight this evening. Give yourself a hand. General, how many are we expecting tonight? He said all 300 plus. I must admit, I didn't quite believe him, especially again with the, the bad weather we've been having. But I'm convinced you are here. You are here because of what this great night is all about. And we are all going to enjoy it immensely here tonight. Thank you. when we think in terms of what tonight is actually all about, I had to reflect myself as, as I thought about the significance of the evening. Think about it. Just recently, we have seen and we have heard through the electronic medium tributes finally, at least, being paid to those who gave their lives during the Vietnam era. Somehow we even got around to giving them a memorial in our nation's capital of Washington, D.C. A beautiful one it is. I've not seen it yet, but I understand from those who have, it is quite a, a memorial. We hear now, too, that suddenly the Korean veterans are saying, hey, what about us? What about us? We'd kind of like to have a memorial too. And I can, uh, for certain reasons, uh, go along with that myself. Won't say why. I'm sure you can understand. But then when we think in terms of why we are here tonight, that's the significant part. This is a memorial. This is a tribute to a gallant few who have done so much. And I say to you, and it's obvious by your, your attendance here tonight, as Jesse Jackson said, the time is right. The time is right. That's why we're here tonight. I'd like now to get the program underway by calling upon Master Sergeant Howard Ferguson, who is president of Chapter 66, the NCO Academy Graduate Association, who will have his group post the colors. Let's have a posting of the colors. <clears throat> will you all stand? It is customary that you remain standing with posting of the colors and the thing of the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Those in military uniform will stand at attention. Those in civilian attire will stand with their right hand, right hand over their heart. Colors.
say after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Howard Ferguson, Republican of the Certainly a dear and revered friend of mine, and I'm sure of yours, a man who stands out tall in this community. Heads up the McDonald McDonald Parish and is the executive director of an organization we all have heard about and continue to hear about. Focus Hope, Father William Bill Cunningham will give us our invocation. Father Cunningham. Second at a time, I thought you said I headed up McDonald's. <laughs> really felt that. But uh, Madonna, Madonna is uh, maybe more important than me. Uh, may I ask you to continue uh, uh, not eating? As I told some good folks before, I'm not blessing that the chair you already ate. <laughs> so we're going to start where we are, and I'm going to ask you to remain seated and let us pray. We're uh, assembled, uh, God, in, our, in, in your uh, good place here in Detroit, in this lovely uh, Cobo Hall, to celebrate with the Tuskegee Airmen as they began a really marvelous and new venture to bring their achievement to our young people and to the generations that come with the, with the Fine Museum exhibition. They call us together under their banner, the pride, attention, and progress, the pride in themselves, their ability, the progress that is afforded based upon our own accomplishments. And we ask your blessing first in Thanksgiving. That's an important prayer, but thank you. Thank you for a group of uh, men who, in an apartheid country, separated from the promise and the ideals, nevertheless, joined together and became a part of this nation's proudest defense. Hearing all of the rest say, no black man or colored, as they said in those days, could ever really be an airman part of the uh, great pride of the American Armed Forces and its Air Force. Under some criticism, the Department of Defense was forced to give them their little place with inferior equipment. <coughs> they distinguished themselves, fighter groups that never lost a bomber in their convoys. 
The only group of fired planes in the entire annals of the United States that ever sunk a destroyer was machine gun fire. Now, as much as we believe in peace, we also believe the achievements of our brothers and sisters of another time to excel in a way that gave us giants in the city today and an example for our young people. Are we ever ready? We're proud. We ask you to bless our youth in the future. With such models of achievement that our young people in their most difficult time can rise to this model of accomplishment with potential and trust and pride in their ability themselves. May the Tuskegee Airmen and their model move our youngsters to become what they had never otherwise could be. We offer this prayer. To you, God, our Father, in thanksgiving and petition. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Cunningham. You know, as I walked in here tonight and looked around me, both right and left, the first thought that came to my mind was, after I had seen, of course, a few of my civilian friends, and I say a few, because there is a lot of brass Army, Air Force in this room here tonight, both past and present. I tell you, I, I haven't seen anything like it. We are well represented by our nation's armed forces here tonight. It's a great feeling, though. It is a great feeling, again, that finally, finally, we get around to the tributes that have taken so long to be gotten around to. As we do at all of these affairs, ladies and gentlemen, we have a, a portion of it that we call introduction of our head table guest. Bear with me, if you will, just a few moments. I'm going to start, actually, on my left. I'm going to do some introductions and ask our head table guest here to stand. Then I'm going to swing right over here to my right and do the same. And I'm going to ask you if you just hold your applause until everybody is standing and then please give them the applause that they so rightfully deserve. Let me start here. I'll go down on the very end here. Ed Vaughn, Executive Assistant to the Mayor. Sue Savage, President of the Detroit Tuskegee Airmen Exhilarator. Father William Bill Cunningham, Director of Focus Hope and Pastor of Madonna Parish. Wardell Polk, National Board Member of the Tuskegee Airmen. Ted Talbert, author and producer, film, tape, and all of those things. And our visitor from the great state of New York, Nancy Colon, National Secretary for the, for the Tuskegee Airmen. To my right, Barry Dressel, Director of the Detroit Historical Department. Betty Allen, Deputy Director of the Detroit Historical Department. Reverend Norman Osborne, Pastor of Bethel AME Church. Cups. Just in time, Reverend. Great timing. Henry Bowman, National President of the Tuskegee Airmen. This is R. Alexander Wrigley, President of the Detroit Historical Commission. Has not arrived yet. Lucius Theus. Director of Civic Affairs, the Allied Corporation, President of the Detroit Chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen, and a revered, retired General of the United States Air Force. And our speaker, whom we will hear from tonight, our great guest speaker that we will hear from tonight, Otis Smith, Vice President and General Counsel of General Motors, retired. And now he is of counsel with the law firm here in Detroit of Lewis White Clay, Lewis White and Clay. 
Let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you. 
You know, understandably, a question that may come to your mind after seeing this film, which of course shows young men in training and in combat after the war. The question probably, as it comes to me too, is, well, what are they doing today? What are they doing today? Who are they? Where are they? What are their livelihoods like? What are they as individuals like? Well, I think all of us know and have known of some, like I, who were Tuskegee Airmen. We know of these men who have come a long way from their office beginnings to become senior military officers, master sergeants, senior master sergeants, chef master sergeants, most of whom, however, who I guess are retired today. And what about those who return to civilian life? Today we read about and we know that Tuskegee Airmen are mayors of, of a great city, such as here in Detroit, that one is a, a former lieutenant governor of the state of Colorado and now a vice president of the Grumman Aircraft Corporation. One is a former borough president of Manhattan and now a CEO of a thriving business conglomerate with emphasis in the field of broadcasting. One is a vice president of a company we're all familiar with called the General Foods Corporation. One that we see even in media, oftentimes now, is a vice president of Eastern Airlines. One is a director of several corporations. One a vice president of American Natural Resources. One a vice president and partner of Moody Hope Travel Agency. And we know who he is. One a plant manager of the General Motors Corporation. One, a principal of a San Antonio high school, and one, a retired instructor of mechanics and avionics. And certainly the list goes on and on and on. So you, you see, ladies and gentlemen, these men and women did continue to serve their, their country and ours in a variety of ways after serving in that great war, as we call it. There are, as I said before, many Tuskegee Airmen with us this evening. Many of them, as you look around you or next to you, can be identified by the, the very distinctive blue jackets that they have on. They will be here for the affair that we're going to have and the fun we're going to have later this evening, the afterglow. And I'm sure that if you've got questions or anecdotes or stories that you'd like to share with them, these blue jacketed Tuskegee Airmen will be more than glad to share those, those stories with you. I'd like to ask now, as a tribute to them, the men in blue jackets here tonight, come on, stand up and give the, give the applause you so rightfully deserve. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I'm honored to be with you this evening on behalf of Governor James J. Blanchard, Governor of this day, to bring you greetings. Greetings, it gives me great pleasure to be on honorary chairperson, Mayor Coleman Young, J. Mason Reynolds, and Alan Schwartz, and extending my official and personal greetings to all in attendance at the first of the reception and dinner of the National Fiscidia Aaron Center of Excellence event. It is fitting that we recognize this auspicious occasion. Fiscidia Aaron is incorporated, organized by black Americans who trained near the Fiscidia Institute of Alabama and fought violently as a separate unit in North Africa and Europe in World War II, is now dedicated to inspiring youth of all races and religions to achieve excellence both in their education and chosen careers. The proceeds of this affair will be directed to a worthy cause, the renovation of the National Fastidia Alvin Center of Excellence Museum, located within historical Fort Wayne in Detroit. In addition to attracting youth as a museum, this structure will facilitate lectures, counsel, advice, and inspiration concerning the educational and career pursuit of our youth. Mr. Otis M. Smith is worthy of our thanks and praise for his many contributions toward Michigan's quality of life. As a former General Motors Corporation official, Public Service Commission Chairman, Auditor General and Supreme Court Justice, Mr. Smith stands as a true hero of which our youth can be proud. As he is honored during this game, I wish to extend my sincerest best wishes for his continued success and happiness. On behalf of the citizens of the Great Lakes State, I offer my sincerest best wishes for an enjoyable evening to all. Kind regards. Sincerely, James J. Landry, Governor of the State of Thank you very much, Mrs. Clark. And I know you will extend all of those thanks to the Governor who could not be with us here this evening. Next, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be honored by the National President of this distinguished organization. He's the president of the, of the Tuskegee Airmen. Henry Bowman, as I previously announced, is the vice president of the Hilton Hotel Corporation. And Henry Bowman is himself a very distinguished Tuskegee Airmen. I'd like to welcome at this time to give a few remarks. Henry Bowman. Henry? <laughs> Mr. Fox, day of guests. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor and a privilege for me to be standing before you at the first annual banquet for our Tuskegee Airmen Museum and Center for Excellence. It was snowing when I left California this morning. I'm kind of glad to be here in Detroit for so many reasons. But for those of you who know me, I'm not much or making speeches or anything because there's a lot of business to be taken care of. For those of you that don't know me, the Tuskegee Airmen is probably the closest thing of all to my heart. And it gives me a great deal of pleasure to look out and see so many beautiful faces and people who are interested in the Tuskegee Airmen and are helping us to make the kind of world that we want our young people to come up in. And I want to have everybody who has children, young children coming up, to make a pledge to themselves to get these young people off of the streets, get them back into the school, and let us help them continue their education and go on to pursuits that none of us can ever dream about. Again, it's good to be here, and I'm glad to see so many beautiful faces, and thank you for having me speak. Thank you.
kind of let you continue your dinner. We will come back in a few minutes and continue our program, but at this time, please continue your dinner. Now, before I go, though, I do want to make an announcement. There is a car with its lights on that whoever the owner is, if you are here, please hurry out and turn those lights off. It is a Chrysler pro uh, product. License number 139HZX. 139HZX. I hear someone style in the corner. Chrysler. Outside with the lights on. Thank you. He's from Indianapolis, Indiana, and his name is Charles DeVoe, and he has not been to one of these things in years, and here he is tonight for Detroit's first. Stand up, Charles DeVoe, let us recognize him. Raise your hand, Charles. There he is. Good to have you here in Detroit. Happy to be here in Detroit. Hello. What's that, Charles? I'm talking about my weight. <laughs> Things have changed a little bit since 42. Okay. Well, Alan Sparks, senior partner of Conagan Miller Sparks and Cone and an honorary chairman of tonight's dinner, sends his regrets that he could not unfortunately be here with us this evening. He did, however, donate a table for use of the students that you see out here in the audience. And I'd like at this time to introduce Mr. Wardell Polk who will recognize those students who are in attendance here tonight. Wardell Polk. Thank you, Tom. I can see that a number of you have a look of apprehension on your faces as I come to the mic, because you know I generally take undue advantage. But the only reason that I'm here now is because I had to sign some kind of document in blood to the effect that I would not take one to it, man. But I would like to call upon uh, Mr. Rocket, Director of Benjamin O. Davis Jr. Aerospace Technical Center of the De Detroit Public School System. Mr. Rocket. Mr. Rock? Ah, oh, here we are. You will have a few words from Mr. Rock. Flight 
training program for high school students. We have 10 students. I believe this is a landmark operation too. There are some other schools throughout the country that offer flight training, but as a club activity. We have selected 10 of our finest students to be involved in a program. They're 11th graders, and they're working towards completing the requirements for private pilot licenses. And they should have a private pilot license and either an airframe or a power plant license the same day they get their high school diploma. And this is indeed a tribute to the kinds of students that we have. Detroit Public Schools. I'm very proud to be the director of the center and very proud to continue the heritage that we have in aviation technology in the Detroit Public Schools. We are located at the west end of the Detroit City Airport. We have probably the most unique structure of, of classes available for high school students, young adults, old adults. We also have an adult education program during the day, during the evening, and we also have an associate degree program with two community colleges in the Detroit area, Wayne County Community College and Macomb County Community College. The grades are 10 through 12 for high school. We have a group of students who are there for 11 months, and they're there full time and receive a Detroit Public School diploma along with the licenses they have earned. We have a group of students who come in part time under the Vocational Technical <laughs> Center concept where they get their academic classes in the home high school and they get the technical training at the Davis Center. They follow the regular school program. We have adults during the day who are working towards completing the airframe power plant program or licenses. We have the evening program with the two community colleges I mentioned where they are also able to work towards an associate degree in aviation technology. We feel very pleased and very fortunate to be in the field where we can be part of this great organization, the Tuskegee Airmen, and I would like to at this time recognize seven of the outstanding students from the Davis Center. I'd like to have them stand as I call their name. Xiomara Avila, 10th grade. Rachel Martin, 12th grade. Robert Day, 12th grade. We have another Robert, and it's Robert Gage. And Robert Gage is 10th grade. Robert? Philip Crude, 10th grade. Lori Stevens, 12th grade. Brian Salisbury, 12th grade. Would you all stand, please, so we can recognize all of you as a body. In addition to the students who are here tonight, I, I would like to pay uh, the first time tribute to one of your Tuskegee Airmen, an instructor, flight instructor at Tuskegee, and has been a math instructor, an astronautics instructor, instructor and flight instructor at the Davis Center. And he's going to be retiring this year. Some of you do know him. Gilbert Cargill. Mr. Cargill, would you please stand?
Uh, we've got a few proclamations here, just bear with me, that I'd like to have presented at this time. First, from Wayne County. Wayne County Executive Bill Lucas is not here with us tonight, but he sends his proclamation. I have it right here. It's a beautiful proclamation. It says, from the office of Wayne County Executive to the Tuskegee Airmen, don't get edgy, I'm not about to read all of these whereas on this proclamation. <laughs> but let me just briefly give the ending here. After about five whereas, it says, therefore let it be known that by the authority vested in me as the Chief Executive Officer of the County of Wayne, and on behalf of all good people therein, I hereby authorize the issuance and presentation of this official document to commend and salute Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, and to extend best wishes for an enjoyable and successful dinner this 13th day of November, 1985. Additional congratulations from the President of the Detroit City Council, City Council President Irma Henderson, who is not with us tonight, but she sends her congratulations and best wishes to Arthur Carter, who is Dean of Wayne County Community College. Arthur? Thank you, Tom. I have really two proclamations. I would like for, on behalf of City Council President Irvin Henderson, I would like to <coughs> present this award of recognition, which is presented to Otis M. Smith, Esquire. It is an award of recognition, and it comes from the entire Detroit City Council. Honored and 
privileged to have been selected to introduce our honoree tonight and to present to him a token of our esteem. However, before I do that, I'd like to recognize another individual who has recently made an outstanding contribution to the story about the Tuskegee Airmen, which we think is so important to bring to the people of America today, and particularly the youth of today. I would like to ask Ted Talbert if he would please come forward. Ted Talbert, I have here a plaque for you that reads, Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, the Tuskegee Airmen National Center of Excellence Museum proudly prevents, presents to Ted Talbert its Meritorious Achievement Award for production of an excellent television program entitled <coughs> An Eagle Should Fly, done in Detroit, Michigan on November 13, 1985. Audience, congratulations to you and please keep up the good work. I was told I should be here, and now I, well, I should be. Uh, uh, I want to be here, not just because I should be here. It's difficult for me to explain or try to pass along the warmth that I have for these men who are known as the Tuskegee Airmen. My story goes way back with these guys. When I was in high school, in Northern High School, my algebra instructor was a man by the name of Richard Maker who was standing with a balloon there and I was playing with a balloon. <laughs> okay, here. Megan would come to our class teaching algebra and say things like, uh, I was shot down over oh, Italy. This, we're talking 1961, Northern High School on Claremont and Woodward, Detroit. And Megan would come into our classroom and say things like, I was shot down over Italy in World War II and I was held a prisoner of war in Germany. And we'd say, yeah, who are you? Uh, John Wayne or John Garfield or Tom O'Pop? No black guys flying planes in World War II. Quite to my surprise, as I wrote, wrote, I began to research the story of the Tuskegee Airmen, and indeed, making one shot down. And along with Alex Jefferson, see here, where is Alex Jefferson? Right here.
truly an eagle should fly. And, they, and Elmore Kennedy, Doc Kennedy, <laughs> I see him right here. With, I, I just my eyes just have to touch on it. Three thirty second bomber who didn't get a chance to go overseas <coughs> because they didn't want the fight. The the the, the fighters, the fighter pilots to go to fight. Night night. Really want, didn't really want them to go overseas to fly. But these guys were very important to the history of this country and that war. And they made a difference. And to think that in night, the night, early 1960s, when I was a student in high school, that we didn't know anything about these guys, that we didn't know any information, and it was like hidden from us, was to me appalling. And when I had the opportunity to see some of these living people, Wardell folk, uh, Chauncey, all, all of them, Holloway, all these guys are living now, and that made a difference, and it really mattered in that war. It was an opportunity for me to really offer you this plaque. Otis Smith and all these. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you Again, just before we introduce our honoree, you know, it occurs to me that all too often we forget some of the people who serve us so well. And there are two of them here, Nancy Lieutenant Colin, pioneer nurse, beloved by all of us, helped care for us, gave us the tender loving care. But then I'm also reminded of another person who goes even farther back with us and from the very beginning, Della Rainey. Della Rainey was already commissioned a nurse at the outbreak of the war. She was the first nurse to transfer to Tuskegee. She came over there, worked hard, became our chief nurse, and provided the care that we as Tuskegee Airmen needed so much. Nancy, would you stand, and is Della. Is Della here? Della Rainey. Della Rainey. Thank you. 
we honor you, we greatly appreciate your contributions as a role model and all that you have done for our nation. And so with that, I present this plaque. Again, Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, and it says the Tuskegee Airmen National Center of Excellence Museum hereby recognizes and salutes Otis M. Smith Esquire for his exceptionally meritorious achievements as a Justice of the Supreme Court of the State of Michigan, Auditor General of Michigan, Chairman of the Michigan Public Service Commission, Vice President and General Counsel of General Motors Corporation, and of counsel of the law firm of Lewis, White, and Clay, and most importantly, his overall excellence. And so we then proudly present to him our Distinguished Achievement Award done in Detroit, Michigan, on November 13, 1985. So again, heartiest congratulations to you, Mr. Smith. Well deserved. Well deserved. There is no doubt, is there, that we selected the right person for this honor. What do you think, huh? Thank you very much, uh, Lou Theus. Uh, I should say General Theus. And if we were both in uh, Air Force uniform, I, Sergeant Smith, would give you a snappy salute. <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster, President Kerji, distinguished guests, and to the friends of the Tuskegee Airmen Museum. <coughs> it is obviously a, sig a signal honor for me to be <coughs> chosen by the Detroit chapter of Tuskegee Airmen as the first recipient of its annual salute, and I am most grateful for this recognition. I am proud to be a Tuskegee Airman, not only because of what some of our colleagues did in combat, but the many great things that the Tuskegee Airmen have done in civilian life. Luthius, for example, Coleman Young has been mentioned. Bill Coleman was and is a great Philadelphia lawyer who was Secretary of Transportation under President Ford, and others who were less well known. Now let me give you an example. One name has not been mentioned tonight, nor has been alluded to. Not long before I retired from GM, I received a call from Clarence Finley, who was a pilot in the 477. I had not known Clarence Finley in the uh, outfit. I, uh, I had not known him, I had forgotten about him, and he had forgotten about me, but he knew about me at General Motors. So he called me on a business question, and after we had uh, exchanged pleasantries and exchanged the proper I and F, F identification, I asked him, where are you located? And he said, just around the corner from your New York office, I'm on 6th Avenue and you're on 5th, right? And of course that was correct. Clarence Finley is group vice president in charge of all manufacturing for Burlington Mills. And he's ensconced in that beautiful Burlington house on 6th Avenue there in New York City, along with equitable life insurance along that road on the Avenue of America. <laughs> there are many others that I could talk about who are, have done very well in civilian life. I was asked this evening by a free press reporter, how do you account for how well some of the airmen have done in civilian life? And I guess the only answer I could give was uh, perhaps a true answer, and that is the outfit started out with a group of very high-class people. It was not to be expected that they would do uh, less well in civilian life than they did in military life. I am sure that many of you saw the movie The 
long gray line, which was essentially a good drama about the Corps of Cadets at West Point. The men in the gray army dress uniform, hence the title, The Long Gray Line. There are, I am sure, many other great stories about American fighting men, the Fighting Sixth to Ninth, Great Rainbow Division, and others. But I doubt if there is any more historically poignant story than that of the Afro-American fighting men who before 40 years ago had to struggle to get in the armed forces on an equal basis with other Americans. It is our version of the long gray line stretching back to the 1700s, the colonial days, down through every war and police action, in Vietnam and yes, even to Lebanon today. The long gray line is highly descriptive of our participation because when you mix the color white with black, indeed you do get red. The long gray line for us began with the famous event on the Boston Commons in 1775. Some American colonists were being pushed around by British redcoats. One of them was an Afro-American, Crispus Abbas. When these colonists resisted the brutality of the British Redcoats, the Redcoats opened fire, but Crispus Abbas fell dead, the first to die in what was to become the Revolutionary War. Historians wrote cryptically about Crispus Abbas' death that he was the first to defy and the first to die. Shortly after that came the Boston Tea Party and the war for the liberation of the American colonists was begun. And when the British tried a backdoor maneuver to get back into the country during the War of 1812, we were there with Andy Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans where we again shed blood for the continued independence of this blessed nation. And when the nation was torn apart by the Southern secession and the firing on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, our forebears were not all sitting around waiting to be freed. There was the famous Massachusetts Colored Regiment. And there were volunteers from Ohio Pennsylvania and Michigan. Most important of all, after President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, over 100,000 newly freed ex-slaves joined the Union forces to help bring Lee to Appomattox. We were there in the long gray line, and Lincoln himself was quoted as saying that the efforts of the 100,000 tipped the scales in favor of the North. And on it goes. In America's one plane at imperialism, the Spanish-American War, we were among Teddy Roosevelt's rough riders when he charged up San Juan Hill in Cuba. And many of us in this room and remember our fathers and uncles coming home to die from the poison gas they received at the hands of the Kaiser's forces in Germany in World War I. Many of us are all too familiar with the sadness and dismay of our elders who returned from Chateau Ferry and the Argonne thinking that having fought to make the world safe for democracy, which was the battle cry in World War I, that things would be a little better, only to be forced back once again to the same old mold. It was terribly discouraging, as 
you must go. But then came the watershed during and after World War II, when the forces of history couldn't be held back any longer, and the significant contribution of the Afro-American fighting man was finally recognized. General Mark Clark began integration of the 104th Infantry Division, Timberwolf Division, remember? That was near the end of the war in Europe, and then shortly after the war was in, Secretary Forrestal integrated the Navy, and soon thereafter the other forces followed. But that's getting a little bit ahead of the story. Because in World War II, there were a number black combat units, including the 92nd and 93rd Infantry Divisions. But none was more exemplary than the Tuskegee Airmen's 332nd Fighter Group, about which you've heard so much. This represented our continuation <coughs> of the long gray line. We shall return to its formation, the first unit of the Tuskegee Airmen, its mission, some of its accomplishments, and in particular its contribution to the end of segregation in the armed forces. But let us continue for a moment the litany of our long gray line by referring to the police action in Korea, which when the North Koreans and the Chinese came plunging into South Korea, the nearest combat ready unit of any size was the famed 24th Infantry Regiment, still largely all black, and stationed at Schofield Barracks in Hawaii. They caught the brunt of the enemy forces and were all but decimated. The long gray line continued into the Vietnam action, where the kids, white, black, and Hispanics, the underclass who could not chose not to find safe haven in the colleges and universities, fought and died in our most unpopular war. Let me say parenthetically that if you haven't visited the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, you simply must. As you have read, it is a stark, it is stark in its simplicity. Basically, black marble, the name of each American soldier who died, 58,000 plus, etched in this black marble. Take some time and read some of the names, like that of the white kid from Arkansas, Tommy Joe Branson, or the Hispanic kid from Texas, Jose Rodriguez, the black kid from Alabama, Willie Thomas. Then look around you. Vietnam veterans came back alive, standing in perpetual watch over the names of their fallen comrades. And then look at the tearful families touching the name of their fallen son. Then you will understand something of what the Vietnam War was all about. Approximately one-fourth of those were black kids. Going back 45 years or so, the war clouds were gathering over Europe, while here in the States, the events were slowly taking place, which would lead to the formation of the first combat training unit of the Tuskegee Air. Professor Gilbert Ware of Drexel Institute in Philadelphia has recently concluded an authorized biography of the late William H. Casey where civilian aid to the Secretary of War in the early 1940s is regarded as the father of the Negro in the Air Force. With complete access to the papers of Judge Hastie, Professor Ware has reconstructed the story of how Tuskegee Airfield came into existence. It is instructive and highly interesting. Except for a few blacks used as construction laborers, there were no blacks in the Army Air Corps before Tuskegee. 
And this is how it all got started. In 1939, the law was amended to provide that civilian pilot training program, which was already available at certain white colleges, be extended to five black colleges, including Tuskegee Institute and Howard University. White cadets who successfully completed civilian pilot training were routinely taken into the Army Air Corps. But the same privilege was at first denied to blacks. Under strong pressure from within by Mr. Hasty and from black civil rights organizations on the outside, the service finally agreed to accept black candidates for training in the Air Corps. And although there were three white centers already in existence, training white pilots, the Air Corps was not yet ready for integration, so it built Tuskegee Airfield near Tuskegee Institute in Alabama and announced plans for the 99th Pursuit Squadron to take black trainees from the various civilian pilot training centers. Now, most of us know the story by heart, but I am recalling it principally for our guests. Eventually, the 99th, under the leadership of B.O. Davis, Jr., was sent to North Africa to fly reconnaissance, and it is reported that the unit performed so effectively that any doubt, there was considerable doubt, that the technical task to be adequately performed by blacks was removed, and the great experiment was declared a success. There is much more to this story I shall pass over the tale in the interest of time. One important event cannot be overlooked, and that is Bill Hastie's resignation as civilian aide to the Secretary of War in an act of conscience against the refusal of the Army to train airplane mechanics, black airplane pilots rather, at one of the three existing flight centers. <coughs> His resignation from such an important post shocked some consciences, and as a result, the process of utilization of blacks and technical capacities was accelerated, and ultimately, the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. Three other squadrons of fighter pilots were trained and joined the 99th overseas to become the 332nd fighter group. The other three squadrons, which made up the 332nd, trained in advanced training here in Michigan at Selfridge Field and also at Astora. So there is a strong Michigan <coughs> And after these squadrons shipped out from Selfridge Field, the 477th Bombardment Group was formed, but for reasons best known to Air Corps headquarters, the unit was soon moved to Gardner Field, Kentucky, immediately adjacent to Fort Knox. That was my old argument. Despite the obvious success of the 332nd, the Air Corps did not seem to want the 477th overseas. According to combat instructors whom I interviewed as first historian of the 477th, our group was mishandled by the 1st Bomber Command. How else could you account for the fact that many of the white combat instructors who were sent to prepare the 477th for combat had significantly fewer hours in the air than their trainees. They couldn't understand it, and neither could we. But then nothing, nothing can detract from the great success of our brothers in the 332nd, who flew 1,578 missions over Europe, mostly as escort to American bombers, not, as you've heard, ever having lost a single bomber to enemy aircraft. They won the Presidential Unit Citation, and individual flyers won their share of the Air Medal, Bronze Stars, the Silver Stars for Gallantry, and the second highest award possible, the Distinguished Flying Corps. All we ever wanted was to prove again our love for this country and for its organic law constitution. It 
It is all long gray line dating back from Christmas Addis. Boston Commons in 1775, that we as Tuskegee Airmen have sought to serve in the highest and noblest traditions of this beloved land. We shall always fight the enemies from without. We shall also fight the enemies from within who deny full freedom to any living soul within our borders. In the words of the Johnson brothers, Shattered beneath his hand, may we forever stand, true to our God, true to our native land. Thank you.
Tuskegee Airmen. The first shall not in this case be the last. I think this first salute to that that you stand for, to that that you were all about, was just magnificent. And I think it points out, most importantly, that when Detroiters do something, and in this case, Detroiters did something with the help of their counterparts from all over this glorious country, we do it well. And I say, as we close out here, let's give again these Detroit Tuskegee Airmen and their counterparts from all over the country a big hand for a great It is time now to do what they know best in the military, retire the colors. Sergeant Ferguson, it's your job. Take over. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant. Ladies and gentlemen, the benediction now of Reverend Osborne Bethlehem. Thank you. 
take picture back here.